Hello everyone and welcome to the Carlham Cymru revision sessions. The session this evening will focus on physics at AS level and will be presented by Mr James Ridd from Convig Comprehensive School in Bridge End. The session will last 45 minutes where James will revise nature of waves topic. If you have any questions during the session, please use the question and answer section and we'll do our best to answer your questions. You will see that there's a hyperlink in the Q&A section. Please leave your name and email if you are interested to receive more information on future events. Today's session will be recorded and the recording and any relevant resources will be uploaded to the ESCOL website under the Carlham Cymru tab. Thank you, James, and over to you. Thank you, Jane. Um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, we're going to look at um, the nature of waves, which really is the, the basics and the fundamentals of waves. Um, and uh, let's crack on. Now I've got the specification and what you need to learn. To begin with, then, we're going to start off by thinking about the idea of what a progressive wave is and the fact that it transfers energy without transferring matter. And that's a a fundamental thing that waves do, they transfer energy without transferring matter. Now, in most cases, you can transfer men energy and matter. So, for example, if I was to, I don't know, throw a stapler at you, for example, then I'd be giving that stapler um, kinetic energy and I'd be transferring energy as it traveled through the air in that stapler. And of course, if it was to hit you, then, you know, you'd know about it. But the point is there, that's transferring energy, but it's also transferring stuff or matter. The fundamental thing about waves is they manage to transfer their energy without transferring any stuff or matter. Now, a fine example of this would be sound. Now, through the medium that you're listening to this, there's a speaker on your computer, presumably, or maybe uh, you're wearing headphones. But the point I'm trying to make is that that speaker is vibrating. It's causing a vibration to travel through the air. But crucially, the air itself isn't moving from the speaker to your ears. That would be very strange indeed. It's only the vibration that passes through that medium, which in this case is air, uh, is air that actually is transferring that energy to you. Another good example of this would be obviously our sun or any star for that matter. Um, when you think about the light that we receive from the sun, it is certainly obvious that it transfers energy. But of course, with the exception of the solar wind, I'm not going to get into that, it does not transfer matter as well. The vast majority of the energy that comes from the sun is transferred via electromagnetic radiation. Again, energy and not matter, but ignoring the solar wind, which is charged particles, but you know, hey. Uh, and then of course there's water. We're all familiar with water. When you drop a pebble into a pond, then those ripples that you see are in fact, of course, waves. And those waves will travel from point A to point B. The water itself though, and this is really important, the water itself doesn't move from point A to point B. Um, and then finally, I thought I just finished off. The last one I thought I'd mention would be seismic waves. So if there is uh, an earthquake where the tectonic, sh tectonic plates shift, then um, of course that will produce seismic waves, which is what effectively an earthquake is. It's the it's the movement of the ground, isn't it, that causes the the destruction, much like what we've um, seen in um, in Syria now and, and Turkey. So that is again an example of a lot of energy being transferred this time through the medium of the ground, I suppose, and in this case as well, the mantle of the earth. Right, so moving on then, now that we've described that, we're going to jump straight into the difference between transverse and longitudinal waves. Now, the word progressive wave, I should mention this word progressive wave, we'll come to in just a moment. And essentially, uh, I'll address that when I address uh, transverse and longitudinal waves. So in a transverse wave, and you may have seen this demonstration in the lab, uh, we have um, the particles in the wave moving 
perpendicular to the direction of wave motion. So if my wave was moving in this direction, then the particles within the wave, excuse me, particles within the wave, okay, would be moving, of course, up and down. In this case, that peak would be moving towards um, becoming a trough, right? And similarly, uh, if I take this trough here, this is on its way to be moving up, all right? Wave is going from left to right, particles moving up and down, they are moving perpendicular too. Now, in a longitudinal wave, and again, you may well have seen this demonstration with the slinky, we have our, if you like, force or energy causing the particles here to move back and forth in these directions. And effectively now, this is moving, or the particles are moving in the same direction or parallel to the direction of wave motion. And this is what constitutes and defines a longitudinal wave. Um, this region here is a compression. This is an expansion, sometimes called a rarefaction. Um, and that's really all you need to know is those two definitions. Transverse then waves, or if you like the particles, oscillate, vibrate, move is fine, I suppose. Perpendicular to, or at 90 degrees. I mean, really, I expect you to say perpendicular at this stage in your education. Perpendicular to the direction of wave motion, and in the case of longitudinal waves, it's parallel to. And just as a little FYI, and this might be a little bit of revision from key stage four, light, water is pretty much transverse, um, and then uh, sound waves would be an example of a longitudinal wave, okay? The progressive part then, well, progressive really means that the wave is moving from point A to point B. And it's really what we distinguish between, we distinguish between progressive waves and stationary waves. Now, I'm not gonna get into stationary waves because that's gonna come later, but to show you a little example of what I mean by progressive wave, it's the idea that at some point later on in time, this wave will have moved on. And it might well be in this position at some arbitrary later time. And the point is that these particles then, the peak has moved, if you like, the peak has moved um, like this distance here, okay? But th these particles then will just be moving up and down. So as you can see, I've drawn that little red dot now and it has moved down. So that peak would have moved down or if you like that element, that part, that coil in the spring will have moved down. But if you consider maybe what would have happened to this part of the, oops, excuse me. If you consider what will have happened to this part of the, the um or the trough well, let's go here maybe just to make it a bit clearer okay if i look at this element here um if i follow the green dotted line now that will have moved up to here okay and in the progressive wave all these particles are going to oscillate with the maximum amp amplitude they're all going to go from peak to trough and peak to trough and back and forth as the wave propagates along all right so that's the difference between um, transverse and longitudinal waves. Now we're going to look at the term polarization. Now, a very tricky thing to wrap your head around is what we mean by what we mean when we say that light is a transverse wave, because um, the oscillation to be perpendicular will not just be up and down. It's not just left and right, it's on a diagonal, it's in every which way you can possibly hope to imagine. The wave is oscillating at all point in all directions, perpendicular to the direction of the wave motion, almost as though you can imagine it in its own plane. Now, when we talk about polarization, what we mean is that those oscillations are filtered into just one direction. And if you look uh, just here, you can see that in this diagram, if I have a light source and I polarize that transverse wave, 
I can do that by using something called a polarizing filter, which you can see just here. Now that polarizing filter is like a series of slits that will essentially cancel out and block any light oscillating in any direction other than in the orientation of that polarizing filter. So you can see here, you've just got two waves um, in this example here. You've got the blue um, oscillations and you've got the, the vertical orange oscillations. And of course, it's only the vertical orange oscillations that pass through that filter. And now what we have is polarized light. And we define polarized light or a polarized wave as a wave which is only oscillating in one direction or maybe one plane. That's polarization. Um, I'll just talk quickly about a couple of applications of polarization. Um, some of you may have gone to see um, a 3D movie, possibly in um, say the IMAX or any 3D movie. Now modern 3D technology works by using polarizing lenses. Two images are projected onto the cinema screen and both those images ha are made out of light which is polarized in one plane. So one of the images is um, made of light which is let's say oscillating horizontally and this isn't easy to draw but maybe one of the images then that's on the screen is made up of light which is oscillating vertically. Now the point is that if I have some polarizing filters on my glasses such that one is arranged horizontally and the other is arranged vertically, then one eye will only accept the horizontally polarized light. So this will only accept horizontally polarized light, whereas the other one will only accept vertically polarized light. In other words, the lens, if you like, on the right hand side, as you look at here, so lens B, okay, will only receive, if you like, the light that is vertically polarized and it will block off, okay, the light that is horizontally polarized. All right, so um, that's a neat thing and that's what gives you that depth perception then because three dimensional vision is essentially your two cameras, your two eyes seeing two slightly different images and then your brain sort of interpreting that and putting a sense of depth to it. So that's how those work. I thought I'd just show you that. Anyway, um, one other thing as well is to do with how polarization happens due to the reflection on the surface of something like water or in this case I think it's snow. It looks like snow doesn't it? I think so. Snow. Anyway you've got your light which is oscillating looking every single direction here and as it hits the surface of the snow it's only the light that is orientated in the same direction as the surface. So if you imagine your surface here is horizontal, then it is only the horizontally polarized light that will be reflected. OK. Um, right. Now, one more thing about polarization then, because um, there is a specified prac. I'm not going to talk in detail about the specified prac, but I am going to mention uh, a polarimeter, which is um, a feature of that practical. So a polarimeter is a piece of apparatus, it's a device, it's a measuring device that will allow you to essentially work out the concentration of a chemical in an optically active sample. Right, what on earth does that mean? Well, let's say now I have a factory that makes sugary drinks like Coca-Cola, for example, and I want to monitor just how much sugar there is in the 
drink that I'm making, but I don't want to stop my machinery and, and, and have to take a can off the production line and open it and test it and then say, yeah, everything's great and then carry on again. It would be better, wouldn't it be better if we could constantly monitor the the sugar content without actually stopping the machine? Well, this polarimeter will allow you to do that because first of all, if we start at the bottom end here, we'll have uh, a light source. Then that light source then takes our unpolarized light. We pass it through a filter, which now obviously filters it and orientates it um, in one direction only. Then though, what will happen with an opti optically active sample? In this case, look, it's, um, well, it could be anything actually, but it could even be amino acids. As the light, the polarized light passes through that substance, like in, in the example I was mentioning, it could be um, a sugary drink like Coke. Um, what will happen is the orientation of that polarized light will turn. And interestingly, it will turn by or an amount which is proportional to the concentration of sugar. Now, part of the reason for that is to do with the fact that sugary substances and glucose has a lot of positive charges. And because it's got a lot of positive charges, it's got um, an electric field. It's actually on a fundamental level why um, sugary drinks are sticky. And that electric field then um, interacts with the electromagnetic radiation and causes it to turn. The details of that you don't need to be fully aware of. That's fine. But of course, when I get to my detector then, if I turn another polarizing filter, I am able then to determine exactly how much the light has changed in its orientation, the angle through which it's turned as it's passed through the active sample, and then determine by how much the light has turned the concentration of um, the substance, okay? Now, um, I, I haven't put it on you, but one of the things that you need to be aware of as well, of course, is that <clears throat> if you have um, plain polarized light, um, oscillating in one direction, I'm going to try and draw this best I can. If you have plain polarized light oscillating in one direction, um, like so, and you attempt to pass it through, a polarizing filter which is orientated at 90 degrees to that, then as an observer, okay, you won't see anything. Now, were you to rotate this through 90 degrees, then what you'd observe is as you rotated it, that the intensity of light that you'd see would begin to increase to a maximum until, of course, you know, the polarizing filter is orientated in exactly the direction that will accept that polarized light. That, children or young adults, young adults you are, aren't you? You're not children. Young adults. That uh, will do for polarization. So I'm going to say that's done. Difference between transverse and longitudinal waves and the term polarization. Now we're going to move on to um, the terms phase and uh, in phase and in antiphase. So in phase and in antiphase. So this is to do with two waves and the interaction of two waves. When we have two waves uh, orientated in such a way that they are uh, um, peaks. Oh, that's a terrible job. Let me try that again. Whoops. Excuse me. Excuse me, what happened there? Right, when we have um, two waves orientated in such a way that their peaks and troughs line up like so. See how the peaks and troughs are lined up? Now, I could have done a better job on that, but there we are. We say that these waves, these two waves are in phase. And for now, that's all you really need to know. A little later on, you're going to learn about, or you maybe already have, learned about something called superposition. Now, superposition is where two waves interact 
and the displacements of both waves are added together to produce, I guess you could call it a resultant wave. And in fact, what we've got here is the superposition of those two waves underneath. Now, the phase difference here between these two waves is zero. They are, in fact, what we say in phase because the peaks meet the peaks and the troughs meet the troughs. But what the effect that will have will be to create a far larger wave. Right? It will have double the amplitude because the amplitude of both those waves is going to add together to produce a really large wave. Now, that's um, in phase. And now we're going to look at antiphase. Now, antiphase is where we have peaks meeting troughs all the way along. And they are completely out of phase. The subsequent superposition of those two waves, as you may have guessed, if a peak meets a trough, if, if you like a maximum positive displacement meets a maximum negative displacement, the result of that will be that they will cancel each other out. And you'll end up with, and this is in fact, you know, an outcome, um, zero displacement for those two waves. Just to jump ahead a little bit, when waves are in phase, we will say that they are either perfectly in phase, if you like, and the phase angle is zero degrees, or we say that they are 360 degrees out of phase. Now, why do we use the term 360 degrees? Well, if you think about a circle and well, let's think about let's think about imagine a, a runner going around a circular track. If he was to start running around the track and then his teammate maybe or another guy is just about to start, if the other guy starts to run at exactly the same moment as the first guy gets back to the starting point, then both of those will be running at the same time. They will be in phase. So they could either start together. This is important. Those two runners could either start together at exactly the same time and of course be in phase. But if one of the runners started exactly one complete cycle or one complete lap after the first guy, then they, again, they would both be in phase. And when you think about it, the one guy will have gone through 360 degrees he will have gone through one full cycle and they'll be still in phase. And as you can guess, then we could have 720 degrees. In terms of antiphase, then, well, how could they be perfectly out of sync? Well, that would be half of those values. So we'd have 180 degrees. We'd also have 180 degrees plus then our 360 which is going to be 440, 540, and so on. So you can keep on counting those up, okay? Uh, I might just mention while I'm here the pi equivalent. Now, in terms of radians then, which is something um, you should be aware of by now, 360 degrees is two pi radians. Um, this is four pi. And then out of phase here, we've got pi and pi radians out of phase. And then, of course, well, I say of course, maybe not so obvious. This is, in fact, one and a half. 540 degrees is one complete cycle plus a half a cycle. So that's 360, which is two pi plus an extra pi. That's a lot of pies, three pi. All right. Uh, I'm going to just pop back up here now because I, I like to do this to keep us all honest, keep us all on task. Um, the terms phase and antiphase done. Now, uh, we're going to move on to the terms displacement, amplitude, wavelength, frequency, period, uh, and velocity of a wave. Again, a lot of this might be a little bit of revision. So we're on to E and F. Now, here, we've got two different, well, we've got two waves. To the untrained eye, to the non-physicist, you know, you guys are, you, you guys are fine. I'm sure you're all 
geniuses but to the untrained eye these can look like exactly the same things but we have to pay very careful attention to the x-axis here to interpret what both of these waves are telling us in the first instance our axes are displacement in the y direction and in fact displacement in the x direction you'll notice they're both measured in meters and what i want you to imagine is that this is the equivalent of taking a snapshot of a wave forgive the handwriting my pen broke just recently and i haven't had time to replace it so this is like taking a snapshot of a wave and maybe the best way to imagine this is um to be imagine you're out at sea and it's quite a windy day you see lots of waves going by and you just took a picture that picture would show many waves right that you could see in your um, image and it would show the heights of the waves and how far they were spread out you have got a static moment in time of several waves that is what this first graph is really telling us or, or is what it's it's showing us when you have such a graph you can with your snapshot image measure the distance between two successive waves and work out exactly what the wavelength is and it is simply the distance between two peaks or two troughs however at a level because you're a bit fancy now um, you really should be using a definition like the distance between two corresponding points because as well as the distance between two peaks being um, one complete wavelength and as well as the distance between two troughs being the same thing any two corresponding points like I've just drawn there or maybe even here those would also qualify as wavelength all right now wavelength as you're aware has a symbol lambda um i don't know why they called it lambda i mean like you know if you see my previous video i got i have got a theory on why mu is called mu but i've got no such thing uh for lambda anyway <laughs> You can also as well from this determine the amplitude, which is the height of the wave. But again, to be specific, it is the distance, the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position, whereby this here is the equilibrium position. So amplitude from middle to top or from middle to bottom. Onto that second wave, which looks similar, but isn't the same. What are we looking at here? Well, this is with respect to time. What I want you to imagine here now, um, in terms of how you should interpret what this wave is telling you, is again, we'll use the ocean as an analogy. So in the first instance, we imagine taking a picture of the, the scene in front of us, the waves, and we can see them all. And we've got a, a, an image which shows, you know, exactly uh, like a static moment in time and displacement in X and Y directions. This one here is a bit more like being on the boat taking that image and monitoring how you move up and down with time because what you're looking at here is the motion of a single element or part of that wave and how it changes with time so we're not considering the whole wave here not at all we're just considering a part of that wave a point in that wave and what it will do over time now as we know at any point in the wave like we, we showed earlier on when we looked at um, progressive waves will move up and down with maximum amplitude which is what you're seeing here but what this will tell us is how long it takes this will tell us how long it takes to complete the cycle whereas the other one told us the wavelength the distance between two waves so if i mark on the distance here to here what I've now got is the time for one complete cycle, which we call the period, okay? And the period is measured in seconds. Wavelength always measured in meters, but this is the period in seconds. And if we know the time for one 
cycle or one wave, then we can, of course, then work out the frequency. And that is how many waves we have per second. And the simpler relationship you need for frequency and, and period is F is equal to one over T. Frequency being the number of cycles per second, which is measured in, oh, it hurts. All right, measured in hertz. And similarly, this would also be the time period. OK, this would also be the time period T. So two similar diagrams, but actually telling you different things. Right, let's go back up here and see how far Mr. Ridd got. Uh, so uh, most of the way there, actually, uh, we did that, but we haven't done the velocity of the wave. But we'll we'll get to that maybe in just a moment because we're going to be defining the wave equation very shortly. The velocity wave, if you think about it in very simple terms, is you know how far does a peak travel in a certain amount of time? I mean, it's it's no different to the definition of velocity for you know any object moving really, except we're tracking the the speed of a peak, if you like, instead. So graphs of displacement against time and displacement against position for transverse waves only is what I just went through. So those two different graphs, albeit looking very similar, uh, uh, have just been described. And of course, what we can be, uh, what we can determine from them. Uh, let's look at the wave equation then. Uh, now the wave equation, if we imagine the speed of a wave, and again, I've done sort of like the boat scenario here. We've got our little boat. It is a boat. It's not a great boat, but you know, it'll do. If you imagine, let's say the waves are moving, oh, let's say in this direction, okay? Then the boat is going to be moving down very shortly. And then if you like this peak here, this peak here is going to be moving towards the boat. Now, if you think what we've got here, we've got one whole wavelength between, got one whole wavelength between the boat where it is in its current position and this crest of the wave coming towards it. All right. And that distance we call a wavelength. Now, the, the time it's going to take for that crest to arrive at the boat is going to be equal to the time for one complete cycle because the boat will have had to have gone down and then all the way back up again. The boat will have completed one complete cycle, all right? And that is, of course, given by the time period T. Therefore, what we can say is, let me just go over here a little bit, give myself a bit of room. If F is equal to one over T, um, like we just described. Well, well, let's let's just do it in normal terms first. So speed is equal to distance over time. And of course, we know that F is equal to one over T. So we can substitute that in because F is equal to one over T. If we substitute that in, we end up with V is equal to F lambda. Now, a um, little caveat there. The WJC tend to say C is equal to F lambda when we're talking about waves. OK, C is it. Hey, that's a pretty good lambda that is, isn't it? Look at this one here. That's a that's a pretty good looking lambda. I think you'll agree. So, yeah, that we've defined then um, wave speed. That is the wave equation. Um, C is often used to describe the speed of light, but um, it's a bit interchangeable when we're talking about waves. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, where are we? Yeah, OK, so we've done point G. Now, point H, the idea that all points on wave fronts oscillate in phase and that wave propagation directions, rays, are at right angles to wave fronts. What does that mean, Mr. Ridd? I'm glad you asked. You're in you're in safe hands. So what do we mean by wave fronts? Well, um, if I were to drop a um, pebble in uh, some water, you, you 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 know what would happen. You'd get some ripples, some concentric circles that moved outwards radially, and we'd call the wave fronts then the peaks. 
So the peaks that we've got there uh concentric circles you can literally see the peaks there and you can see the troughs as well so this would be a peak and of course this would be a trough which is the bit in between isn't it so that's what we mean by wave fronts okay now importantly when we have wave fronts the wave fronts will always be in uh, in a, sorry, perpendicular to the direction of the wave. So my wave is moving in this direction, and my wave fronts are perpendicular to it. Okay, it's the three D diagram, so that's why it looks like it does. Okay, and that means then, if I sort of extrapolate that diagram that I've got there, if I draw this, then my wave fronts will look like this. So if I have wave moving in that direction. Then if you like the crests of the wave, which is what these are, same as these, okay? The crests of the wave will be perpendicular to the wave direction. So wave fronts perpendicular to wave direction. There's a couple of different examples here. So if we've got like um, our sort of pebble in the pond scenario as we have on the left, then of course we'll get these radial um, rings which are um, emanating outwards but of course the direction of the wave then we can draw a wave normal as we call it will always be like we just said perpendicular to the wave front okay now it's easier in a diagram such as as this one here of course in this one here what we've got is parallel wave fronts and that makes it really easy to draw our um, wave direction onwards. This becomes more important when we look at wave properties. These diagrams um, and this becomes far more relevant when we discuss ideas such as refraction, reflection and even diffraction because that's where these diagrams really come into their own. But for now that's a, that's not a bad little starting point. So with all that in mind, I think, yeah, we're going to look. We're going to highlight this last one, wilderness. Um, now, this is the practical work. I did briefly mention that measurement the intensity variations of polarization. Um, so, I mean, that's going to be um, something that might be covered in another video at another time, um, but we're going to leave that there for now because I thought what would be a good idea to do with our last, oh, not much time actually, um, with our last 10 minutes. So, it's good looking past paper. So, let's do that quick, 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 quick. Uh, right. Okay. So, some past paper questions then. A transverse progressive wave is traveling from left to right along a stretched. Oh, I can't read that. That's okay. It doesn't matter. We know what it means to me. Along a stretched string or something. Okay. Um, the diagram. Oh, there we are. The diagram shows a uh, part of the string at one instant. This is from January 2011, just in case you're interested. Um, legacy spec, old spec. So write down the wavelength. Well, it says write down the wavelength. Big clue. You don't have to calculate anything. You just need to write it down. So there's a peak and there is another peak. All right. So one wavelength will be the distance between these two peaks. That's going to be 0.2. Uh, what's it in? It's in meters. Now, just as little FYI as well, you could have done between there and there, you would have got the same answer, still going to be 0 0.2. Calculate then the speed of the waves. That's the next bit. Okay. Um, calculate the speed of the waves. So it tells us you've got a frequency look of, of 50 hertz, which is excellent news. And we can just use the wave equation to very quickly do this. Uh, v is equal to F lambda, which is equal to 50 times 0 0.2, which is equal to oh, 10 meters seconds to the minus one. Sorry about the writing, kids. Next then, we zoom. Oh gosh, I keep on missing that. Next, if we go down, calculate the time taken for one cycle of oscillation. Well, again, we know that F is equal to 1 over T, which is equal to um, 1 divided by the time for one oscillation. Oh, sorry, we've had to 
Oh, sorry, we've had to rearrange this, isn't it? T is equal to 1 over F, so that's going to be 1 over 50, and that's equal to 0 0.02 seconds. On the diagram above, draw the string at a time of 0 0.005 later. Right, so what we're going to think of here is if the time taken for one complete oscillation, it tells us the time taken for one complete oscillation, look, you've just worked out to be 0 0.02 seconds. Then what is 0 0.005 seconds later going to look like? Well, first of all, that value here, I hope you recognize, is a quarter of this. So what we'll know is that we'll have gone through a quarter of a cycle in that time. So we need to draw this one quarter of a cycle later. Draw the string in a time, not put five seconds. Later. Now, uh, half a cycle later would be 180 degrees out of phase. We don't want that, all right? So quarter of a cycle later would mean that we are, now let's just get this perfectly right now. And uh, see later, yeah. So we know it's moving in this direction. So this peak will have moved, if you like, uh, a quarter of a cycle along. Um, now, this is really going to be a challenge for Sue because I haven't got my pen, as I said. So I'm going to start my peak there. Oh. 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 Have I managed it? Yeah, we're doing all right. OK, it's going to look like that. All right. Cool. Oh, just missed it there towards the end. Oh, damn it. Oh, damn and rat. OK, so quarter of a cycle later would look a bit like that. Essentially, your peak and your trough are all moved on by quarter of a cycle. OK. Explain why the waves are called transverse. <sighs> That's almost too easy. It is one of those questions where if you haven't revised your definitions and your key terms, it's going to be impossible. But really, if you have, and I know you will, if you do revise, then that's one moment where you can just go, oh, this is lovely. I just get to write an answer, get a free two marks. Okay, so learn your key terms and definitions. Um, explain why the waves are called transverse. Well, the oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of wave motion. Therefore, the waves are transverse. Uh, it is also possible, oh, we're not going to do this one. Okay, we're just going to put a little line through this because that is... Uh, for another time. This is all to do with stationary waves, but don't worry, Mr. Ridd's got uh, another question we can have a look at quick. Number two, um, light is a transverse wave. Yes, explain what is meant by a transverse wave. Believe it or not, I'm not going to do that because we've just done it. What is meant by polarized light? Again, polarized light, another definition which you just need to learn. It's where light is only oscillating in one direction. Um, Describe what was seen when the source of polarized light was viewed through a polarizing filter, which is rotated slowly as shown through 360 degrees. Well, let's see now. It says that uh, a source of polarized light was viewed through a polarizing filter, which is rotated slowly as shown through 360 degrees. Now, you'd have to assume that this polarized light is. Um, let's get this right. Describe what's seen when the so when a source of polarized light. So this source is already polarized, and for it to actually be observed, we'd have to assume that it was already vertically polarized, because otherwise it wouldn't have passed through the filter. So essentially, at zero degrees, you'd have had, um, if you like, the max, or you'd have had the light passing through. At ninety degrees. You have a minimum or none, min. Then at 180 degrees, remember now every 90 degrees we see this variation. You'd have had max. And then at 270, another 90 degrees, we'd have had a minimum. And it says up to 360, doesn't it? So up to 360 degrees, we'd have had a max. 
All right. So in terms of what that means, it means you have a maximum of light coming through, minimum of light, amount of light coming through as we orientated that filter differently to the vertically polarized light. Could have been a bit easier, but yeah, that's that. Let's see. Oh, we're nearly close on time now. Um, one last thing then, determine the wavelength of a wave. Um, if we're looking at um, a top down view here, we're looking at the wave fronts, then the wavelength of the wave is quite simply the distance between two peaks. All right. And this would be our lambda. Oh, we can do a better lambda than that, I'm sure, but um, that would be our lambda. That's how we determine the wavelength of the wave. So in this instance, it would be three centimeters. And um, I think given the time, uh, we are done. So uh, I hope you have a better understanding now of wave basics. Some of that is going to be in a recap from key stage four. Um, but next we'll be moving on to uh, more wave properties. And um, I hope then in subsequent videos um, we can get um, really towards understanding waves in a far, far deeper way. So with that, thank you very much. And Jane, back over to you. Thank you, James. I hope you found today's session useful and next week's session will be at the same time and we'll focus on, as James says, wave properties.